Hi, welcome to Heart of the Shelves. My name is Kara, and this is Nali. We're two friends from high school. We've known each other for many years, and so this is our own little book club. We'd love to talk about books and share with you what we've learned. Yeah, and today we are going to talk about the House in the Cerulean Sea by T. J. Klim. So the book is right here. Um, before we start, it's been about a month since our last episode. So how have we been? Wow, it it has been a month, and you know this um. This month is a February month, so it's Black History Month and is Valentine's Month. We can't forget that, and also LGBTQ Month. So I, I've been busy actually. Uh, I've been doing a lot of side projects, and I started gardening, so that took up quite a bit of my time. What about you? How are you doing? Well, it's eleven months into this pandemic, so. I know a lot of us are just ready for it to be over, but I've been finding ways to socialize with people and also be safe and socially distant. So Valentine's Day, while being still in this pandemic, was definitely interesting. Um, I had I uh, went out with someone and we both like wore masks the whole time, and it was it's just really wild dating in this pandemic. Yeah, I I don't know how people are doing it, but I mean I already have a boyfriend, so I I'm not like starting in that scene again. But uh, I can't imagine dating in pandemic. Do you just go on Tinder and you know swipe right <laughs> everything? Um, <Yeah. laughs> anyway, so let's uh let's jump to this book. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the summary of this book? Yeah, so this is a really amazing book. It's a Lambda Literary Award winner, um, which uh, the Lambda Literary Award is an award that's given to books that have like queer, queer themes, and it does have two gay characters in it, and the author himself is also queer, and it has magical, magical children. Think like Harry Potter, topped with like the sweetest love story ever, and. Um, it has themes of like justice, and it gets us to think about like how we can make a change in our world. Yeah, um, and if you notice, the cerulean, which I just found out today, is a cerulean. It's a color. It's a this sort of a blue, dirty sky blue color. So like you know, like this shade right here. If you guys ever have a book, um, but basically, this book explores these eight characters, well, nine characters. Um, Linus himself, which, who is the main character, we actually follow him throughout uh, the story. He's this 40 years old caseworker. He works for uh, Daikami, which is a department in charge of magical youth. If you want to have a comparison, that's kind of like, a, I would say CPS? Yeah, Child and, Protective Services. Yeah, CPS. So what he does... Um, he goes to these orphanages and he he observes um, and he basically writes a com- recommendation of whether this place stays open or stays closed. Uh, so he's pretty important. But that being said, um, these uh, Daikami is a corporation. It's a government corporation and it's not a it's not the best workplace. Um, but that being said, they uh, asked him to work on a case. They basically promote him. And uh, yes, I did say promote in a weird way because it wasn't like, oh, hey, you did a great job and here you go, promotion. It was more like you've been really, really observant and and we don't trust this place and we don't trust anybody else. So we're going to just show it to you. So anyway, um, Linus got, uh, was given this case, which contains seven files. Uh, six of those are the kids, and then one of them being the headmaster. That being said, the case files are very, very um, um, not thorough. It's very loose, and he goes on to uh, this island, which... Which he does, he knows nothing about because this orphanage is not even in the registry. Well, I mean, it is a registry, but like it's not well known to people. So anyway, um, Linus goes to this island, and then finally, when he gets to the um, the village nearby the island, because you have to take the ferry from the village, he uh, read the case 
uh, the case files, and he was in shock himself because because we get to see who these kids are, and he got a brief introduction of these kids. Um, uh, do you want to explain who these kids are r- really quick? Um, yeah, there's uh, six kids. There's um, Talia, who's a 250-year-old gnome, and she loves gardening. She's 250 years old, but in gnome years, so um, mentally she's probably, I don't know, like seven, seven years old or something, and she's like really still a kid. She loves like teasing people and playing around. Then there's Fee, who's an island sprite, who's kind of like a fairy, and she's she's kind of learning how to be a fairy still. So she, her role model is um, Zoe. Zoe, yeah. who's um, an older sprite who kind of gives her guidance and stuff. Then there's Sal. So he's fourteen, and he um, he's been through a lot of trauma. And he's really shy and scared as a result of this, probably. And he's been, like, shuffled from orphanage to orphanage, just like a lot of kids in our foster care system are. And um, one one time in a previous orphanage, he he was abused by one of the people there. And as a result, he bit the woman who was abusing him. And she turned into a dog because that's that's what happens to him when he's when he's like really scared or something he turns into this pomeranian dog and so the woman that he bit also turned into a pomeranian and because of that he was sent to the orphanage that he's living in now and this is actually the first place that he's felt at home and so there's him and then there's uh lucifer who goes by the nickname Lucy. And he is the Antichrist, as you might guess. He's the le- devil's child. And everyone um, who doesn't know him is really scared of him because they're worried that he can destroy the world. And he does say a lot of like really um, terrifying things, but he's really joking most of the time. Um, and he has these like terrifying nightmares sometimes where he 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 calls them spiders. He thinks he has these like spiders in his brain and he's really worried that he's going to hurt people. But the the key is he doesn't really want to hurt anyone. He he spends all his energy trying not to cause any damage at all. So those are the kids. And then there's Arthur who is the head of the orphanage and he's kind of like a father figure to all of these kids. Um, Arthur was also a orphan when he was a kid and he also suffered like similar um, similar things to what the kids went through and I think because of that he identifies with the kids and he wants to give them guidance the guidance that he never got as a kid. Yeah. Yeah, Arthur is an amazing headmaster, and he's definitely a father figure for all these kids. Um, We actually forgot Chauncey and Theodore. So Chauncey is this little jellyfish block. We don't really know what he is because um, we don't have information on his parents, so his origin is kind of wiped out. Either wiped out or they just never, never knew. But he's this jellyfish blob that that um, loves to be a bellhop. He practices how to be on bellhop every day, and um, and he he just wants to help people. And his family, the other kids, let him help, let him practice being a bellhop on them. So that's really cute. And then we have a uh, we have Theodore, who is uh, a wyvern. And if you don't know what a wyvern is, because I didn't know either, um, a wyvern is um, it's part of a dragon family. It's like a uh, it's like a bird, but also a dragon. It, it's somewhere in between, and uh, he chirps, so that's his own language. Even though he doesn't speak the same way as other kids, it doesn't stop them from communicating. They all just know what he's saying so it's really neat to see how cohesive this family is uh but that being said of course uh we're giving you all this information but linus doesn't know that yet all linus saw was you know lucy was the antichrist uh chauncey Mm -hmm. is a jellyfish blob uh 
and Talia is no, and then uh, V is a sprite, and then Chauncey is, well, whatever the, the he is, and then Theodore is just a, a wyvern. So that's all he knows. So he gets there, he gets to the island, and he tries to be very professional because, you know, in this world, when you're a caseworker, you have to be very professional. You kind of have to keep it distant. Uh, distance from the kids it can't really be uh meddling with their their issues but at the same time uh linus struggles between being a caseworker and like caring for the kids because he does want the best for these kids um he he really cares for these children because that's because that's why he became a caseworker um but um later on he learns that Hey, I need to not be so distant to really learn about these kids because they are humans. Well, they're magical beings, but you know what I mean. Like, they're still kids. They're still humans with complex feelings and and emotions and thoughts and processes. So, um, so he, he finally kind of started to let go of his uh, distance and then and just go along with the kids. And then together with the kids, Arthur... Uh, Zoe and um, Linus basically try to uh, try to kind of change the the society. Yeah, that's basically the gist of this book. Yeah, would you agree? Yeah. So, um, do you want to talk about some themes that we saw in the book? Oh yeah, that would be cool. Okay, so the first theme is well, um, the first theme is prejudice. Prejudice is shown throughout this book, and it's really unfortunate that these kids have to go through that. So, uh, the first thing is, is that these kids they are magical beings, so they have to register as ma- uh, magical beings. Well, I'm sure it serves a purpose to the government. Um, when you put a label on somebody, it kind of confines you to that label. Um, just like that, that you know. These kids, because they're labeled as uh, magical beings, a lot of villagers don't don't really like them. Um, I mean, granted, they live in a remote island, and the headmaster kind of shelters them because he's really afraid of like what the villager might react. So he's kind of like, oh no, just stay here until you become ready, which of course doesn't really help the unknown, right? Because when we see the unknown, we kind of we tend to fear the unknown so all the uh, the only thing villager knows is that oh there are some weird kids with magic power living in an island they never come down here we don't know what they look like they're weird and we're gonna keep labeling them as weird that's kind of how the villager mindset is um and and then there's over the whole town not just the village but where Linus is from, which is London, there's this slogan called See Something, Say Something, which I'm sure, again, it started with, like, good intention. Because, you know, if you see something, don't be afraid to say something, right? Like, because we don't ever want people to be afraid to say uh, some bad, unknown things. But now people are using that as an excuse to report on these kids and to be afraid of these kids because they don't want to get to know these kids because they don't see them as as kids at all all they see is these magical weird beasts that that's the, what the village is seeing so we get to see how the kids go through the prejudice there was one time they went to the village and uh the some of the people did not react to them well and uh, mm-hmm. that was really sad to see. Yeah, they were refused ice cream in an ice cream shop. Um, and then people just make comments about them and make them feel not good. It doesn't feel good when someone, like, without even getting to know you, someone just says all this mean stuff to you. Yeah. And you know what's sad is that um, Linus himself was actually a little prejudiced. Mm-hmm. Um, because in the beginning... Um, Linus, when Linus read the Lucy's file, he was like, "Oh no, this is Antichrist. This yeah, is terrible." Yeah, he was terrified. Yes. Uh, and 
and it, it took him a long time to even see Li uh, Lucy's room because so as a caseworker you're supposed to see um, every single room that the kids reside in because you need to make sure that you know they are well taken care of and Lucy was like oh do you want to see my room and Linus was always like uh no you know what I'm a little tired today oh uh I have to go see Sal's room today I'll, I I have to go do this today like he always make up excuses because he was terrified of Lucy um which which is really unfortunate and and then oh Chauncey I don't know if you remember but so like I said Chauncey really wants to be a bellhop and mm -hmm. there were a few times where he's like I know I, I don't look the same as them and I know I look supposed to be like a monster and then you just you know, when you read this, when I read that, I just want to, like, hug him. Although I'm pretty sure <laughs> hugging him would be, would mean that I'm soaked because he's, like, part jellyfish. But, um, yeah, I just want to hug him and be like, no. Like, it doesn't matter wh what you look like. It doesn't matter if you're labeled as a magical being. You are still you, and then we love you. But that's the kind of prejudice that, the, that being labeled creates, um, you know, that you're you're magical but like is that a good thing I, I don't know and then um and clearly in this book it's not a good thing because these kids are being treated very differently yeah yeah and we get to see that um the kids if they are allowed to be themselves they would they would benefit but also they bring so much to the rest of the community also like Talia with her gardening skills, um, she she builds this beautiful garden, and if the rest of the island could come see it, like it would be such a great great contribution. But most of the islanders have never even seen the orphanage because they're so scared. Yeah, which actually brings to the next theme, uh, creating change in an unjust system. You have a lot of thoughts on that. I know we talked earlier, and then uh, you have so many thoughts on it. Um, yeah, so, so Linus, at first, he feels like he's just doing his job, um, and he's just making sure all these orphanages are safe, and what happens after he finishes investigating isn't really his problem, because he's just doing his job, and slowly, he gets to know the kids in this particular orphanage, and, um, he starts to see that they're more than just what their files say they are you know like talia is more than just a gnome um she's also this beautiful gardener and um chauncey is more than just a blob or whatever and he gets to know them and he goes on all these trips with them they go on field trips they eat dinner together he hears them like recite poetry and he sees that um his perspective is changing a little bit and he's also he's building relationships with all of them he's building relationships with the kids and also arthur the the headmaster of the orphanage and then he um he starts like helping the kids like fight back against the prejudice in the island um like one day they get a message in a boat that says like leave we don't want you here anymore and he sends them back a message that says no thank you and so he's kind of setting an example that um you don't have to put up with this and if people treat you unfairly like you don't have to respond with violence but you you should stand up for yourself mm -hmm. and so the kids like slowly start learning that and at one point um they have this field trip and they get to go to the the island um and and this this field trip is caused by well one the kids really wanting to go get um records and and you know other trinkets but uh it started with linus um you know linus was like she said uh linus was changing what they himself uh sending a message back to the uh through the raft to say no thank you that's not that, that's not something that a caseworker normally does because that's kind of like meddling with the orphanage, right? Like you're you're emotionally invested and you don't want to do that. You want to stay objective. But he sees that 
that it's not fair for the kids to be getting these messages because he understands that these are just kids. So I'm glad that he's like changing within himself because it prompted the author to the headmaster to be like, okay, well, I guess it's time to let the kids go out to, um, to the to the island. I'm sorry, to the village. I mean, and I understand that as a headmaster, you know, he wants the best for his kids, and um, uh, because he's not just a headmaster, he he's a dad, he's uh, he's a father figure to all these kids, I and mean, he himself had gone through quite a bit of trauma when he was younger. So, so, but finally, seeing the changes in in Linus, Arthur was like, "All right, let's do this." So they they all went down to the uh, village. From there, oh, the, the, that was a huge event for everybody. So when they got there, they all got all split up into groups. Um, since we're following Linus' uh, character, we get to see what his group does. So his group has him, uh, Lucy, and Talia. And of course, Talia is a gnome, so she loves anything gardening. And uh, she wa- uh, walked into this this garden garden shop. And she saw this shovel, and then she was like, "Oh, this is an amazing shovel!" And then they met the shop owner Helen, and Helen was a little shocked to see these creatures and this person. And Helen was like, "Oh, right." She was a little um stunned in the beginning. She was kind of speechless, but then Talia was just like, "What is the best thing? Do you have this? Do you have that?" You know, he she was just so knowledgeable about gardening that. Helen was just like, oh, I, I could get behind this. And then they just bonded mm-hmm. over the gardening. And and it's, and Hel- you can see how Helen's bubble pop. And Helen is starting to change her mind about these creatures, uh, these kids. And, and no longer in her head is just a bunch of magical beings and the island. She started to see that, you know, these are just kids who wants to, um, buy random garden supply and who's very knowledgeable about other stuff and then and then we later on got to see how um how that little change affected in the story because um later uh, in the day they all went down to the ice cream shop because you know the kids they deserve a treat unfortunately when they got to the uh the ice cream shop the ice cream shop owner was like well, like, what did he say? He said something along the lines of... We don't serve your kind here oh, yeah. or something. Yeah, we don't serve your kind here. And then, you know, that is so unfortunate because you... These are paying customer. These are kids. They may look different. But all they freaking want is ice cream. Who does not love ice cream? Like, every single kid mm-hmm. loves ice cream. And you're turning customers away just because what? They look a little different? And that is not okay. However... However, remember how I said um, the changes of Helen will come into effect? Well, turns out Helen is the mayor of this village. So, you know what she does? She came into the ice cream shop and she's like, you know what? If you don't want to serve, go away. I'm going to serve them myself. And and she served the ice cream to the kids herself. And that was really good to see how uh, how you know, the little changes affect one another. Yeah, yeah. so we start to see that... Um, if you're in leadership, then you do have a responsibility to um, to make laws that that make sure that everyone is treated fairly and there's no discrimination. But also, even if you're not a leader, if you even if you're someone like Linus who's just you know a lowly coast caseworker, you still have the ability to create change. So Linus, when he gets back to his job at Dicomi in London. He's had this life-changing experience of meeting these wonderful children and he's back at his boring job and um, his supervisors aren't treating him very well. They won't even let him put put pictures up on his wall, on his desk. And um, he's worried about getting demerits after like 20 years of working at this place. He's still worried about getting his first demerits and... um, even like with all of that, he's able to do something really radical that 
um, leaves us wondering, is Daikomi going to be disbanded or are there going to be some significant reforms that happen? Um, because he, so he recommends that the orphanage stay open, which is not what the, the management was expecting at all. They were expecting him to like write something scandalous that the children were being abused or something, or the children were like hurting each other. We're not sure exactly what they were expecting, but they thought he would reveal something that would allow them to shut it down because I think that's what they wanted. But he didn't say that, and they approve his recommendation to leave it open. And that's, you know, one of the many changes that happen. And um, so TJ Klune, in one of, an, one of his interviews, said that he wrote the ending in a way that doesn't tie everything up and... Uh, we don't know exactly what happens to the kids and we don't know if Daikomi is disbanded or not, but we know that there's a lot of work that we all have to do still, but there's hope. Like we know that if we want to, we can make change and and anyone can make these changes happen. Yeah, um, you know, we can see, see a lot of parallelism between the real world and and this book um especially with this month being black history month i mean i'm sure we don't have the best history in this country and then we get to see a lot of oppre- uh, oppression and prejudice mm. discrimination and 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 then even in this book you know it, they talk about how change doesn't doesn't happen overnight unfortunately it started with one person it started with linus and then it was a small change where he he decided to send that message back and that somehow created a chain effect and but that chain effect took a long time um it's not like the next day he woke up and he said you know what screw it i'm gonna change everything i'm gonna change people's mind but it doesn't work like that and and in the end i like that TJ Klum created the ending like that because that is the real world. In the mm-hmm. real world, you don't get perfect ending. You get all these, you get better ending, but you know, it's not, it's situational. It's p- placement and like things may be getting better in the village because of Helen, but they said that in the city, the other orphanages are still facing protests and riots and and hate which is not okay and um but this book emphasizes on change within one person because that can lead to a lot of things sure they just happen to meet uh helen who is the mayor of the town but but you know if if linus didn't have a heart of change author wouldn't have the heart of change to send the kids out to the village so i mean that itself is already a big step so i do wish that over time you know society gets better and i know us living in the states we have a lot of issues going on and not just here i'm sure everywhere in the world but but we have a lot of issues going on that just needs reform and hopefully one day we get better reform because right now things are not looking great for some some groups yeah some groups at all the um daikumi kind of reminded me of a few things like um like the police system in the u.s a lot of people are talking about now is it better to like defund the system completely because the police system is built on prejudice and um like a lot of people believe that the police are meant to keep us safe but it's actually a foundation of prejudice and so in the same way that we're not sure if Daikomi was just like disbanded or they made some significant reforms like we're not sure now if we should do the same for police and not just police but like other like similar systems like the juvenile justice system the um there's so many systems where people are marginalized and oppressed and it it just like perpetuates this like cycle yeah um yeah dude that's it's really interesting to see 
a lot of real life scenarios in this book um mm-hmm. and you know we get to see a lot of power play in this book because Saikami basically control all the magical youths and and what's gonna happen once they become adult we don't know and that's one of the things that the author pointed out to Linus is like do you even follow the kids that that you did the case on like Linus doesn't know. Linus is a very idealistic person and he believes that he's helping these kids. And I'm sure whoever started the Daikomi had, well, we hope that they had a very good intention. But but with a corporation that big, there's always some some groups that are getting uh, oppressed and marginalized and that's not okay. And then we have to find... We have to walk that very thin, fine line carefully. Um, speaking on Daikomi, you know, uh, it's also not a good workplace either. Uh, there's a lot of power play that we see. Um, and, you know, like Sonali has said earlier, Linus wasn't even able to put up the picture at his desk because because his supervisor was such a bully. His supervisor enjoys making other people's lives miserable. And and why, we may never know. Maybe because they were oppressed at some point. We don't know. But the work-life balance is not there in this book. Um, Linus is all about work, work, work. And he has this picture of this beautiful beach that's and then a caption of don't you wish you were here and he never got to go to this beautiful beach until he was assigned this case and and that really reminds me of like how life work is like work balances in america because yeah. because we a lot of people work and then what we have like maybe two weeks of vacation that is assuming you're doing a corporate nine to five job if you're doing part time, if you're a student, if you have multiple jobs, you can kiss that goodbye because let's face it, we don't have that many days off. Yeah. So yeah, he had he's never even taken a vacation before. He's spent twenty plus years at this job and um it sounds like the the management just likes like taunting him and um, making him feel bad that he's never had a vacation because they have all these like mouse pads that say like don't you wish you were here and they have this this part of the the ocean and he all he wants to do is like see the ocean he's never even seen the ocean before and he tries to take a vacation at some point but he gets scheduled to work so he has to cancel it return the rental car and everything yeah I would have been mad if I had to do that. Not gonna lie, I would have been really mad if I have to return my my rental car and cancel my my travel plans. But you know, I'm privileged enough to say that I can be mad about it. There are a lot of people who need the money and they just have to work, and and I, I can't imagine. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So Linus eventually he um, he leaves this workplace and he goes. And he moves back to that island where he found his new family. The The orphanage where he was in this book was, like, his newfound family. The family that he never had earlier. Because, like, in London, he doesn't really feel like he has any friends. He doesn't feel like he belongs there. But when he gets to this island, he feels like he found his actual family. And so he goes back to them. But the only reason he feels like he can quit his job and everything is because he has that support system, I think, which not everyone has. Yeah, and also because he, the results of the, the, um, orphanage came back. So, um, so spoilers, I guess, um, he recommended that, you know, the orphanage stays open and they approved him, uh, his request, like, uh, so I had mentioned earlier. And, and because of that, I think he was finally able to say, you know what, I did my job and now I'm going to go back to my family. And and really it's the unconditional love that that he found at the island. These kids, no matter how different they are, they they love each other. Um, in fact, at the ice cream shop, 
you know, Cell. Cell is this little teenager, 14 year old. He gets scared about everything. And um, he got scared by the ice cream man and he turned into this little Pomeranian. And Lucy was like, like, you're scaring my brother. And that is just one of the best lines I like you, that you can hope for. And I'm sure, I'm sure if you, everybody who reads that can agree that like that was the, one of the cutest moment. And and also, you know, Arthur himself, he, like he loves these kids dearly, and he he learns how to talk in Gnomish for Talia, uh, and he learns how to talk in Wyvernish for Theodore. Uh, so that was really cute to see, and it's really the unconditional love that they have for each other that that Linus step upon, and then I think he definitely make the right choice by going back because he never got that from his own family um because we got to see a little glimpse of his mom throughout the book like she has passed away but we got to see a little bit of her, uh, his mom and she was not a nice lady and you know his neighbors are crappy um his his uh workmates are also kind of crappy to him um and and i love this line i, I don't know if you remember but it was i believe um Either Zoe or Helen said this. It was something along the lines of home is not where you live. It's mm-hmm. where your family is, uh, who you want to spend time with. So that was a really cute line. And I, I'm glad that Linus came back to the island for that. Yeah. yeah. So that was, I think, the fourth theme of like family and love. And um, do we like create our own family or are we born into our family? And in Linus's case... His biological family wasn't the family that he chose. It was the family that he found at this orphanage. Yeah, and and that's the same for the kids. You know, the these kids they they're born as something. They're born as the devil's child. They are born as this jelly blob, as a gnome. They 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 are something, but their family is not. It's not their biological family and then that's okay because they have all the support that they need in this group and that's what matters in a family support system yeah and i'm lucky to uh, to read this book and to see how the support system progress and i hope that they they have a uh, i hope that this uh story can apply to like people throughout of the world but i know that some people are not fortunate as others like even sal i mean he he has been moved around so many times and he's only 14 and this this orphanage is the longest he has stayed in and it is three months so can you imagine every one or two months being moved being shoved around to a foster care another foster care like you're nothing I mean, I can't imagine it, but I know that that's what some people go through. Um, so I, my heart goes out for them. Yeah. Yeah. And we get to see also, like, now that he's experiencing this um, love for the first time, what it does for him. And it's the first time that he's writing, he writes poetry, and he uses this little typewriter And he never wrote before. It's just because he's in this, like, safe environment that he feels comfortable enough to do that. Yeah, that was really nice. And everybody, everybody felt safe. And um, if you remember, there was this one scene where Lucy was having a nightmare. And then um, then this was the first nightmare that Linus got her experience. And so when Lucy has a nightmare, everything basically shakes like an earthquake, but times a thousand. And... And all the kids and Zoe are are uh, huddled up in the living room. And then Linus came in. Linus was like, like, are you guys okay? What's going on? And that's when Linus learned that that Lucy is having a nightmare. But you know what? The kids are like, he's not trying to hurt us. He would never hurt us. And they were trying to to tell him all these great things about Lucy because they were so scared that that Linus was gonna use this against the orphanage and then they gonna Linus was gonna recommend them to shut it down. And that was really neat to see because you get to see how these kids are supporting and and you know 
as a parent, that's what you want, right? You want all your kids to support each other, mm-hmm. and like there's no tomorrow. And then we got to see that, so that was really cute. Yeah, yeah. So let's move on to the to the next part of our podcast. Oh, uh, we have one theme left. Oh, we do romantic love. We didn't really talk about that. Oh, oh how did <laughs> I forget? It's February month, and I just skip yeah. all over it. That yeah. was yeah. That was probably one of the best parts of the book, getting to see um. Arthur and Linus fall in love as you in case you haven't guessed by now yes. they have this like really sweet romance um they kind of complement each other because Linus is this rule follower he he never goes out of his comfort zone until he gets to this island and um Arthur doesn't really have any rules he wears these like pants that don't really fit him and these like socks that just looks strange and um and we find out later that he like has this past and they kind of like learn more about that and that helps them bond yeah um th- you know this book is has a queer representation which is amazing and that's one of the best thing about this book is that is that these two are gay but well I don't even know if that's the right word, but the uh, these two are queer, and it's not even the main story. Like I read through the book, and I'm like, okay, they're queer, but what's the story? Like I don't really care that they're queer. It's just another couple, and I love that part because eventually we want to get to somewhere in society where you shouldn't have to come out to your parents. You shouldn't have to uh to come out to your friends. I mean, you can if you want to, but you shouldn't need to, and and I like that here is so normalized that it's just like, okay, well, that's cool, uh, but like, what's the main story of the book, right? So I I love that, and then and then you get to see how Linus gets charmed by by author, and hey, you know, this is like these moments where where Linus was like. No, he he might just charm me, but like not yet, not to the hundred percent. And then, um, oh, there was this one picture that that Zoe printed out for Linus before he went back, which is the picture that he held up, uh, he put up on his cubicle. Uh, is this? Uh, they were all at Zoe's place and Zoe's home, and um, Arthur was watching Linus lovingly and. And all the kids were eating. And then they, it's like one of those moments where, you know, everybody can see that they are falling for each other. And this is like a perfect family. But Linus, of course, took a while to see that. Because, you know, when we're in that situation, we're always like, nah, this, this person doesn't like us. Or, oh, no, we don't like them. But, but yeah, it, it was a really cute moment. Yeah, yeah, I loved all the slow dances and the yeah. little presents that um, Arthur gave Linus. Yes, and you know what's funny? Um, so Arthur came back from his trip, and you know Arthur. I'm sorry, not Arthur. Sorry, Linus came back from his trip, and he remember how he had to make a speech to everyone how he's sorry and how he will never leave them again and and it's funny because like lucy was making demands and lucy was like you're gonna care for us you're gonna hold me and tell me it's okay every time i have a nightmare and then like they just have like all these little cute cute um um cute kid you know threats and like talia she's like if i don't like what you say you're going back to the hole that i dig and you can't complain. It's just like, it's really <laughs> funny. It's like, okay, you're threatening me, but I get it. Um, but the biggest, the biggest part about that little scene was after all the kids make their demands, you know, it's no time for the adults, right? And so author was like, go upstairs, kids. And then the kids are like, oh, fine. Like, we're so not going to look through the window. <laughs> and but before, but before they went up, uh, Lucy was like, why didn't you guys just kiss and make up already? Jeez. And then that was so cute because like, like, we, you know, we know that you guys love each other. You guys don't need to make a show out of it. Like, come on. It's as simple as kiss and make up. So that was super cute. 
Yeah. Yeah, you always learn from kids how to love. Yes. Because they know better than adults do. Yeah. Um, okay, so the next part of the podcast is uh, um, favorite and least favorite characters. Go. Uh, so my favorite was Lucy slash Lucifer. He, he's just so funny. Like, he loves teasing Linus and saying all these, like, horrible things to him. Like, uh, the first day when Linus is at the orphanage, they're all sitting down for their first meal together. And um, he asks Linus if he wants anything to drink. And he says, do you want tea? Do you want water? Or how about the blood of a child? And Linus is horrified. But uh, Lucy's just joking. And you see that he does that a lot. He says these, like, um, things for dramatic effect. But he's he's actually just playing around. And he's so sweet also. He helps pick out a present for Linus. And they kind of have this bonding over music because they both like these, like, old-style records. And um, they they dance together at one point, I think, because they like the same type of music. And... So, yeah, Lucy was my favorite, and my least favorite, I think, was the guy who works at the post office. Linus needs to go to the post office to mail the reports that he's writing for Daikomi, and the post office just makes all these, like, unnecessary, mean remarks about the kids at the orphanage, and he just reminds me of all the Karens in our world, and I just... Those are Chad's. All the Chads in the wall. Or yeah. Dave's. Is it Chad or Dave? It's I've heard those. Chad. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, for me, you know, my favorite... My favorite main character... Oh, I don't know. I just love all of them. Uh, I, They're so cute. And, mm-hmm. like, Chauncey, who loves to be a bellhop. And then he, he washes... Um, Linus is closed, and then Linus was like, "No, you don't have to wash that." But then Chum was like, "That's my job as a bellhop." And then Linus was like, "Okay." And then Talia with her her threats of you know burying a human body, um, and then Lucy being Lucy, and the is just a sophisticated um, garden tree sprite. And then um, Theodore just loves, loves buttons. Oh, my gosh. Oh, which reminds me, one of my favorite quote is um, uh, when author was having a conversation with Linus, um, he said something along the lines of, if you ask Theodore why he loves buttons so much, he will tell you that they sim- it's because they simply exist. And that was one of the cutest moments. But that being mm-hmm. said, coming back to the favorite character, I don't really have one. However, I do have a favorite side character. is uh is the record shop owner in the village. He's so when they all went down to the village, uh, they went Lucy, Linus, and Talia went to the record shop because you know Lucy loves records. And this guy, oh my gosh, this guy is just what well, you would imagine what a hip stoner looks like, sounds like. He was all like, hey, little man, that's rad. Like, that's dope. And and he loves that Lucy loves all the oldies. He's like, oh, you like the classics. Like, oh, th- he was so impressed by Lucy. I don't know. I just love him. And then um, one of his uh, shop assistant actually attacked Lucy. And, and Lucy shelved um, this assistant. Uh, against the wall and then he felt a little and he felt unconscious um and of course like this dude the owner found out and the owner was like oh marty is so getting fire like my bad little dude like i'm so sorry and that was really cool cool to see because you see this shop owner who's like a hip stoner and he's just like like um i love the music and that's why i'm here and uh um, so that's my favorite side character. Uh, my least favorite character, you know, I will say everybody who's kind of against the kids, right? Because y- you don't want that in your life. But I would, if I really have to pick, I would actually say the upper 
extremely upper management. Oh, by the way, the the upper management group is called extremely upper management. I don't know why they named that. I, I really yeah, don't. <laughs> yeah, but um, they're the ones who sent Linus on his yes. mission to the orphanage. And the reason I don't like them and they are my least favorite is that, you know, you know, they have the power to decide what is right and wrong. I mean, the villagers, they they're not in the position of of um power. They don't get to be in the government, and these people have the education, have the knowledge, have the power, and yet they choose to treat these kids, these magical beings, as a second class citizen. That is not okay. The rest, the villagers, sure, they are uneducated, but these people, they have no excuse. Yeah, so. they've never, they're so, like, distanced from everything. They've never met any of the kids. They don't even know their names, mm-hmm. but they're, like, making all these decisions about them. Yeah, so I would say that's, uh, that's my, those are my least favorite characters. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, We actually took a quiz earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's called... Uh, which character are you from, you know, the house in, in the Cerulean Sea? And uh, what did you get? Yeah, so I I took the quiz and it told me I'm Chauncey, the one who's like a little blob um, slash. We don't know what he is exactly. And here's what it says. No one knows exactly what you are or where you came from. Some people think you're a monster, but people who take the time to get to know you quickly learn that you have a kind heart and sunny personality. Your dream is to be a bellhop. Don't let anyone crush your dream, little Chauncey. It's so Aww. cute. <laughs> I got Sal. I don't remember what it was about, uh, what the caption said, but I got Sal. And then he's a little Pomeranian, and then it's this really cute picture of Sal. Um, I don't think I'm a lot like Sal because... Sal is very quiet and uh, yeah, very... I feel like we might be switched. <laughs> yeah, so, but somehow you know the quiz gave us that. But like, um, I think I'm more like Chauncey, and you're definitely more like Sal. But uh, I love both yeah. of them. They are both really cute, cute kids. Um, and you know, if I were to meet TJ Klum one day, hopefully I do because that would be awesome. Um, I would just probably just. Thank him for um, um, for writing this book and then putting in queer representation in a sense where it's so normalized that it's not it's not weird or it's not strange to see these two character as queer and that's amazing to have. What about you? What would you say to a TJ Klum if you meet him? Um. So, I I know that he said he didn't wrap up the ending neatly like wrapped up with the bow or anything because he he wanted to leave it kind of um ambiguous because you know his point was that like change can happen and that we should have hope because we've seen it happen in the book but that we still have like so much work to do and but I'm still just really curious about what happens to the kids in his mind like would he imagine them staying on the island or moving away and like does Chauncey ever become a bellhop and does Daikomi stay like an agency or is it completely disbanded yeah yeah and then uh you were telling me a little earlier that he has another book soon yeah um in September of this year he has another book coming out called Under the Whispering Door and it sounds fascinating it's about a ghost who doesn't want to cross over so maybe we'll do that in another episode in september later this year yeah. and we'll see more of tj clune yeah hopefully we do because he's a great author and i love it um well that brings us to the end of our episode so thank you so much for watching us or listening to us um we're available on all platforms of our podcast so if you can just give us a like subscribe we appreciate that if you're on youtube or on facebook awesome comment you know tell us what character um you're most like and then which character is your favorite or least favorite and just just shout give us a shout out yeah and then um that is it do you have anything else you need to add 
No, see you in March for uh, our next episode. All right. Bye, guys. Bye.